Today's episode is with Dr. Candace Setti. She's known as the weight loss therapist. So she's a licensed clinical psychologist, a cl- certified personal trainer, a certified nutrition coach, a certified weight management specialist, and a certified expert life coach. So it's a really unique combination of education and training. And it's the backbone for her unique approach to weight loss and weight management. Um, so she's going beyond diet strategies. Definitely. I guess you'd probably say she's going opposite of dieting and that whole approach. And she's talking about how to heal your relationship with food and with your body. She also specializes in insomnia and helping with disordered sleep patterns. So, um, I think everyone honestly (laughs) needs to listen to this episode because as she shares right from the start in the episode, pretty much everybody has some sort of disordered eating pattern or likely disordered sleep. And she's talking about like, how, how does that actually impact the body? You know, what's going on with us from a hormonal perspective that causes us to stay in these behaviors. Um, she also has an absolutely amazing book that I shared recently on my social media and it's called the self-sabotage behavior workbook. That's her latest book. She also has several others that we mentioned in the episode and I'll put them in the show notes. Um, but I really love this, um, workbook that she created because there's so much power when you actually have to answer the questions about yourself and see your own patterns. So anyway, I just really appreciate her message. I hope that you guys will enjoy this episode and think about your own relationship to food. You know, um, I share openly in the episode that I find myself in a tough place sometimes in the, uh, fitness industry and, but also as someone who, loves the body, loves my body and wants everyone to have this beautiful relationship with self, you know? So if you don't feel like you have that right now, please listen to this episode. (laughs) And even if you think you might, you still might want to listen to this episode because, um, it's pretty illuminating. So anyway, we'll go ahead and get right into it. Here is Dr. Candace Setti. So I want to tell you guys about one of my favorite finds in the health industry in the last few years. It's something I use with all my clients, and that has been extremely impacting on me as well. And that's the upgraded formulas, hair mineral tests, their consults, and their nanoparticle size minerals. So um, I started on this path because I was taking in a high quality magnesium. And when I tested, I found out that I was extremely deficient in magnesium. And once I started using their nanoparticle size magnesium, my levels went right up. And what I experienced was incredible. I started getting more or REM sleep. I was, I realized I hadn't been dreaming in years, started dreaming again, and also noticed that I didn't think I had anxiety until I got my magnesium back up and noticed that I was experiencing quite a lot of anxiety and that went away and I was able to enter back into a place of calm and peace. And, um, it was just incredible. And so since then I've been using it with all of my clients and it's so easy. All you have to do, they'll mail you out a little envelope and you just put some hair in it and mail it back into their lab. And then you do a consult with them over the phone and they'll tell you all about your ratios, what's high and what's low, because you can't know this unless you test, there's no way to know. And you can't just crap shoot minerals. You have to make sure that your ratios are on point. So they will tell you exactly what you need more of exactly what you need less of to get those ratios on point. So you can have optimized brain health and hormones and sleep and metabolism. So, um, they're also giving you 10% off for being an inside out health listener. So that code is just inside out. So, um, go to upgradedformulas.com and just enter inside out at checkout and you'll get 10% off their consults, um, the hair tests and any products that you may need to get your ratios. Right. So, um, yeah, take advantage of it guys. It's something I use with every single one of my clients. It's been wildly impacting and I'm happy to be able to extend that discount onto you guys too, as a thank you for listening to the podcast. Hey guys, before we get into the episode, I wanted to take a moment to tell you about higher coaching. This is my coaching system and I get a lot of questions because, um, it's not just training and nutrition. We do that. I love training and nutrition, obviously, but we also do more. We do personal development and the way that's delivered is a 90 day personal development program that you go through with me when you work with me. So it's a video course with questions for you to deep dive in yourself for the first 90 days of working with me. Now that comes as part of a morning routine. I am really big on the morning routine and you ask any of my clients, I will push you on that because it's life changing. So we start with meditation and then we do gratitude and then that personal development program. Um, that's our deep dive psychologically. And after the 90 days, you go to the next level, you start doing what I'm doing currently. And it's a lot of strategic goal setting and it's really, really honestly, 
miraculous what's happening, not only in my life, but in my clients' lives. Like it brings me to tears when I get on calls with them. I'm like, do you see yourself? Like, do you see what you're doing? That is so cool. So anyway, that is um, for me, the bread and butter of my coaching. I love it so much. Um, also though, in, in regards to your body, I also like to go deep dive and see what might be holding you back. So that's where all the biohacking side comes in. We do a physiological deep dive as well. So we do blood testing, hair mineral testing, DNA testing, body composition, or a ring. Um, so your heart rate variability, your sleep cycles, do you have any deficiencies? Do you have issues with sleep you didn't even know about? Let's find out, you know? Um, so that's, that's how I approach things in higher. There's more, we do prizes every month, Nikes, Lulu's, um, all my favorite products and foods to keep you motivated, to keep those habits up. We do three zoom calls a week. So you get support. We have a private Facebook group. We're all vibing and, and cheering each other along the way. We get raw and real and honest. And it's just, yeah, it's like, I created my life and I created my life the way I like and I like to deep dive with a bunch of bad A people that really want to optimize their lives and it's an honor for me to serve them in that. Um, so I just thought I would tell you about it because I don't know if I talk about it quite enough. So if you're looking for that, if you're like wanting the next level in your body and also in your life, truly, that's what we're doing. So. Uh, seeking bad A's <laughs> to join higher. I do have some spots open. Um, it is limited. I can only handle so many clients at a time, but if you would like to find out if it's a good fit for you, you can go to my website, taragarrison.com and you can request a call and we can see if, if it's a great fit for you. Um, and yeah, I, I just wanted to tell you guys about higher so you could get a little glimpse into what I'm doing on the daily. And if you're looking for something a little more self-guided, I do have my keto in and out program, um, on my website. Site. So you can either do a small taste and try it for eight weeks, or you can go a full year. That baby is comprehensive. There is a video of every recipe, video of every exercise. There's a 60 day course teaching you how to do keto or 30 days of keto. And then 30 days of bringing back the carbs, FAQ video library, Facebook group, like all of that. So if you're more of like the self guided person and you just want stuff planned for you, um, that is also an option on my website. It's taragarrison.com. I'll link it all in the show notes and all right, we'll go ahead and get into our episode. Okay. So Dr. Seti, I want to jump right into disordered eating. If that's okay. <laughs> what a fun topic. Yeah. Oh man. It's definitely been one that, you know, uh -huh. if my people who follow me on Instagram have, they know what's on the top of my mind mm -hmm. right now in our relationships to our bodies and food and this chronic need to be better and not enough. And I'm never going to be enough. And, um, all this validation from the outside in, and I will earn love. I'll earn self-love and I'll earn respect, you know, all this, it's just this yeah. like toxic. Oh, the world needs help. <laughs> the world needs you. So I was wondering if first you could give some examples of what, how you might know if you might have some disordered eating patterns. Well, um, if, if you're human, there's a very good <laughs> chance that you do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love that. Um, you know, uh, the statistics will show you that at least 50% of the population engages in disordered eating regularly, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. that's based on the people that are aware of it and admit to it. So if we think about the people that either don't admit it or aren't even aware that their behavior is disordered, obviously that percentage is going to be significantly higher. Mm. Um, and really it speaks to our relationship with food. Yeah. And most people will say in some way or another that they feel they have an unhealthy relationship with food. Very few people can say, the only reason I ever eat is because I'm physiologically hungry. And then I stop when I'm physiologically satiated, right? Very, very few people can say that. Yeah. Um, and so when we talk about disordered eating, you know, the, the symptomatology of that is massive, right? It could be people who diet frequently and have chronic weight fluctuations. It could be people who just have guilt and shame around eating. It could mm -hmm. be people who are preoccupied with food and weight and have these rigid routines and rituals around food. It could be people who use food to self-soothe. It could be people who obsessively calorie count or have these incredibly inflexible meal and exercise patterns or, mm -hmm. you know, people who engage in behaviors that we associate with eating disorders as opposed to disordered eating like laxative misuse or, mm -hmm. um, you know, um, compensatory behaviors for overeating or mm -hmm. skipping meals for weight loss, things like that. I mean, but, but the, the, the symptoms of it are very, very widespread. And what they all have in common is they represent a fairly unhealthy relationship with food, one where 
food is not really about nurturing our bodies anymore. It's about all of these other things that tie into our self-perspective, our self-worth, our social acceptance, our body acceptance, body dysmorphia, right? All of these other factors that are going on, whether it be from messages from childhood or from the media or from our friends. But, you know, you see it in all of these different types of behaviors. And it's interesting because I actually do a presentation on the differentiation between eating disorders and disord- disordered eating because it's it's really gray. Um, really what differentiates it is, is the severity um, and the intensity, but otherwise a lot of the behaviors are, are very, very similar. So it's, it's a significant problem, a significant issue that it affects yeah. a significant portion of our population. Yeah. As a psychologist, uh, I'm curious, are there uh, commonalities that you see as like common triggers that start this, like uh, are more common triggers or um, whatever you would call it? <laughs> well, it, it happens a lot when people, f- you know, first start to gain weight, Yeah, wherever that point is in their life. For some people, it's, you know, as early as junior high or high school. For some people, it's like in their mid twenties when, you know, you see a lot of people who say, you know, I've been, I've never had to worry about weight my whole life. And then all of a sudden something changed and they went on their first diet and they started to build a little diet dependency. And that's where we start to see a lot of this behavior coming from is the diet world and the diet mentality, the restriction associated with dieting, the labeling food as good or bad and right or wrong. And, um, you know, the idea of being all or nothing with your food and thinking of food in terms of points or calories or macros, instead of seeing it as something that you enjoy and satiates your food and gives you nutrients, right? Um, So a lot of times diets, our first diet or our diet dependency is where a lot of this tends to come from. So what do you recommend for somebody who, you know, somebody who comes to you and they have, you know, they're, um, they're having health problems because of obesity. Mm-hmm. You know, where do you start with someone like that? Cause I, I can guarantee they've already been down the road of all the, you know, yeah. we think it's so simple. It's like, Oh, I'll just not eat as much. Yep. <laughs> and yeah. then you find out that's not how it works. It's actually yeah. way more complicated. So yeah. like, you know, um, I'm sure so much of your work is helping people come to a good place with themselves and their, yes. and their food and their bodies. Yes. And then, you know, it's, it, it's a difficult thing to finagle. I admit also is like, um, cause I'm also trying to do this work constantly with my clients. That's why I do mindset alongside mm-hmm. my nutrition and training. And it, it's, it's, it, it's an interesting place to be. And I'm wondering like what nuggets that you share with people, you know, what are those shifts that you help people get to so that they can, reach their healthy goals, but in a loving self-supportive way? Well, I mean, you hit on it, right? Those, those are two very significantly different things in the diet world, right? Um, And, you know, a lot of it is about understanding your whys, Mm -hmm. um, your motivation, your reasoning, right? Mm -hmm. Um, When you look at somebody, and so I call this concept, the goals of your goals, but somebody may come to me and say, you know what, I want to lose weight and I don't want to diet. What do I do? And I always say, okay, well, your goal might be to lose weight, but what are the real goals? What are the goals of losing weight? Why do you want to lose weight? Right. Because it's never about weight loss for the sake of weight loss. It's always about the real gains that you get from that. And that's where the meaning is, right? That's where the significance is. I want to... I want to be able to pick up my children and not have aches and pains. I want to be able to get up and down from the floor, Mm -hmm. right? I want to feel comfortable in my body when I'm in front of people. I want to feel more confident speaking in public. I want to, you know, not, not have this constant fear of diabetes hanging over me. Right. And, and whatever it may be, it, it, and it can be all across the board. There's nothing right or wrong here. It's just about understanding that and getting a good feel from that. And then embracing the fact that, Um, you know, weight loss and health are not the same thing. And, you know, it's what the health at every size movement is about. You can be healthy at any size, which doesn't mean you can't want to lose weight, but understanding what that's about Mm -hmm. and beginning to embrace the idea of accepting yourself, accepting your body, appreciating it, understanding it regardless of of its size, big or small, right? And having that be separate 
from what you are trying to do, right? Your body is incredible. Your body has done a lot of things for you, gotten you through a lot of things and, yep. and moves you around and takes care of you all day. And the size of it is irrelevant to that and appreciating your body for what it is and what it does for you and accepting that that is a separate thing. And maybe you want to lose weight here for all of these reasons, which are great, but also here's your wonderful body taking care of you. And and looking at those as two kind of separate and distinct things can be a really powerful way to separate that. Yeah. um, You're the second person I've heard recently talk about this healthy at every size. You say this is a, this is a movement. I didn't even know this is a movement. Mm -hmm. Uh, So, and that's the basis of it is, is appreciating and understanding and recognizing that you can be healthy at all different sizes. Yes, Yes, absolutely. And I mean, it's about kind of doing away with weight stigma and fat shaming and all of these other issues that, you know, you don't know. I mean, you could see somebody who's a hundred pounds and somebody who's 250 pounds yeah. and that 250 pound person can be incredibly healthy. Yep. And that hundred pound person cannot be healthy at all because weight is not the determinant of health. There are all of these other metrics that come into That's it, right. like the way we take care of our bodies, our nutrition, our exercise, our fitness levels, our sleep, our stress management, right? All of these yeah. other factors play into our health and they're not necessarily represented by our size. A hundred percent. I, because I do blood work with my clients, I've seen that, you know, it's like, I've had uh, women who are 200 pounds and their blood. I'm like, you literally have perfect blood work. Like, wow, great job. You know, it's awesome. And And then I have these like fitness Queens (laughs) that come in and whoa, there's like all sorts of, you know, (laughs) we got a lot of of healing to do, you know? So Mm -hmm. I, I love that. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Um, in regards to sleep, you mentioned, I, I want to hit on this too, because you also specialize with insomnia. Yeah. Oh, can you, can you <laughs> t- teach us what you, what you know about insomnia? Um, well, I mean, insomnia is a very specific subset of, you know, we were talking about disordered eating versus eating disorders, right? And we can also talk about disordered sleep and insomnia. Mm. We differentiate them yeah. the same way, right? Insomnia has these, this clinical criteria that needs to be met. And while most people don't meet it, a lot of people have disordered sleep Mm -hmm. in the sense that they don't prioritize sleep. They don't give themselves enough sleep. They don't um, create an environment that's conducive to sleep. They don't have a healthy sleep schedule, right? And and sleep is critical when we talk about health, when we talk about wellness, when we talk about self-care, when we talk about weight management, sleep is critical to all of these things. Sleep and stress management, actually, I will say are my top two. When I work with people, I always tell people, it doesn't matter what you're eating or how much you're exercising. If your sleep is not good, if your stress levels are too high, it doesn't matter what we do because that stuff is going to take yep. priority. Yeah. Um, and so it's all, I, I look at sleep with everybody. Are you, are you giving enough time to sleep? Are you making it a priority, right? If you're getting five hours of sleep a night because you have to get up early to exercise, the little sleep you're having is doing more damage than that hour of exercise that you're doing. So we need to revisit your priorities there. Right. So looking at sleep as a priority, as, as a part of a health plan is really, really important. And that can be, again, looking at things like, when are you sleeping? How much are you sleeping? Um, You know, what does it look like when you're gearing up to sleep? What's your environment that you're sleeping in like, and, and how are you making that a priority? So it's, it's pretty all encompassing, but almost everyone has a little bit of work they can do on making their sleep better and, and helping it work for them. Yeah. I, I love that you mentioned this. Cause like, I, I, I admit even myself, even as a health coach, I went through this stint of like super uber high stress mm-hmm. in my life. And I was totally in like survival mode, like grind, you know, and I, so I wasn't getting sleep and Oh, what happened all of a sudden, all of a sudden I was quote unquote, emotionally eating. And I'm like, where yeah. did this come from? Like, yeah. I, ne- I thought I didn't like do stuff like this anymore. And then what happened when I went, just started sleeping again, it all went away. I was like, yeah. I was literally just stressed out and trying to get energy because well, I wasn't. Sleeping. Yeah. Yeah. And people don't realize how much sleep impacts their hormones yeah. and all of our hormones get balanced. So if we don't get enough sleep or we don't get good quality sleep, all of our hormones get out of whack. And right. so what this does is impact our hunger levels, our insulin levels, our energy yep. stores, our mood, our attention, right? All of these factors are impacted simply because we're not getting good sleep and, yeah. and we can change that, right? The prescription is just good sleep. 
I know. I, I always, I like, <laughs> I was just telling my clients this this morning. I'm like, we are adult babies. Okay. Like we used <laughs> to be babies. We used to be toddlers. And just like they, we needed little sleep schedules and our nighttime uh-huh. routine with our bath and our lotion rubbing and our song yeah, and, our, yep. <laughs> and our teddy yeah. or whatever. Like we need that still as adults or we get out of whack and we uh-huh. what happens to a baby who doesn't have a good sleep schedule. They are grumpy as crap. They're horrible. To yeah. And well, and things- just because we grow up doesn't mean our body doesn't thrive on routine. Our body <laughs> yeah. thrive on routine. Our bodies function by routine. When we talk about circadian rhythms, that's what that is, right? Yeah. And our body thrives on routine. And so when we don't give it a routine, we're actually fighting kind of our natural inclinations. And routine ties in so, so importantly with sleep. And I'm it's cu- such I'm- an important factor. Yeah. I'm curious where you start with, um, I find often with people like if they have anxiety, a lot of anxiety, they like, don't want, or even depression sometimes, like they don't want to go to sleep. They're like mm-hmm. avoiding going to sleep. Yeah. What, how do, yeah. What do you do with those people? Yeah. It's called, it's called the uh, reverse sleep procrastination, um, where, you know, some people will even say they're tired and they just keep themselves up because they don't want to yeah. go to sleep. And it's a little bit of like rebellion and, yeah. you know, to do this and fighting back from when you were a kid and you didn't want to go to sleep and you wanted to stay up and it's not good. Um, but the most important thing is about creating some sort of a sleep schedule. So for even somebody who doesn't want to go to sleep, let's say they keep themselves up till 1 a.m. every day. Um, you can start working from there by simply saying, what if you went to sleep at 1230 instead of one? And you got up at 7.30 every morning. So you're getting seven hours of sleep every night. And let's start with that just as a routine and see how you do. And if that works for you, fine. Maybe that's okay. And we don't need to fight that. But if you need to get up earlier and you need more sleep, then we can slowly start to push that back. Um, you know, we have, we have morning people and we have night owls and, um, it's just kind of the way our, our, our natural body wants to work. And For most people that are night owls, they're forced to fit into a morning person world, right? The world starts at a certain time and, you know, we have these daylight hours that are structuring everything. So it's about kind of finding a way to slowly, you know, parse that person into that world in a way that doesn't feel too, too massively, too much of a massive change for them and allows them to still feel like they're doing what they need to do for them. So it's usually a gradual change. Yeah. I like my whole family's night owls and I've always been a night owl, but I did find that I was able to shift myself into a morning person. But what's been super key for that is like no stimulation after yeah. dinner. Like if yeah. I'm trying to like work and do all the things and run around, yeah. like uh, Tara's not falling asleep. <laughs> well, but you just hit on something really important is that people need to understand what does that for them and what doesn't. And not everyone gets that. You know, they may think I'm, I'm not doing anything. I'm just watching TV and on my phone. That's not stimulating, but it may be incredibly stimulating yeah. for them, right? Yeah. Maybe they're watching things that are very intense or things that are educational or things that just get, get wheels turning in their head and they're not physically stimulated, but mentally they're very stimulated. 100%. And so that may be dramatically impairing them, their sleep without them realizing it. So a lot of this is, is testing like trial and error. Let's really? see what happens when you do X, Y, or Z and how that impacts you. Yeah. My daughter is 15 and she's always, she's constantly, uh, she's very smart and she's wonderful. And, but she, she's always teaching me about how, uh, teenagers are wired to stay up later and you know, all these things uh-huh. and then we went camping and I was wearing an aura ring that tracks like when you fall asleep. And yep. I was like, do you know what time you fell asleep last night while we were out camping and you didn't have your phone in your face mm-hmm. and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. I was like eight 45. You yeah. fell asleep at eight 45. Yeah. <laughs> Just yeah. letting you know yeah. <laughs> with that she natural totally rhythm. Fell in line with her circadian rhythm. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And I love what you're saying too, about the, the routines. Cause I, I can't tell you how many people are like, Oh, I'm not a routine person. I can't do that. And I'm like, I'm the same way. Like, I think a lot of us like to just do whatever, uh-huh. but if you can have the discipline to create that, you can be so much happier is what I found because even with exercise, like that's something I teach as a trainer. Like if you've trained your body to release those chemicals, your body yeah. gets ready, anticipates yeah. that I'm yeah. going to be training at eight o'clock. And then you try to go train at 3 PM one day it's not going to be bueno because your body has literally yeah. will fall into patterns of when it's supposed to release chemicals. Cause that's yeah. what you've been telling it to do. And that just speaks to how your body likes that, right? How your body likes to do that and how it falls in line with it, but also why this is so trial and error for people, right? Because 
you just talked about all these benefits that come from having that routine, but people may be resistant to it because they don't realize those benefits. So yeah. it's about, can we just try this? Let's see right. what happens. And, and for most people, when they experience positive things from doing something, they want to keep doing it. Right. So they need to have that experience and go through that and, and try it on, so to speak, to see how it feels for them. Okay. Now I'm curious if you have, because this is, I, I truly, I haven't found a solution for this yet. I'm still looking, so. <laughs> <Uh-oh>. <laughs> but I have so many, um, especially I've noticed in my male clients also, also female, but like, it's like, I feel like it's like every time with my male clients, they wake up a lot during the mm-hmm. middle of the night and the least little thing wakes them up. And I've, mm-hmm. I mean, I, they've done like blackout curtains and the cold room and the noise machines and the, uh-huh. all the slow release melatonin and like uh-huh. they've tried everything and it still happens. Do you have any insights about that? Um, well, a lot of times it's waking up to pee. Yeah. Um, and so if that's the case, usually it's about cutting off water at a certain point in time prior to sleep, right? If you go to bed at 11 to cut off water at 8 PM so that you're not having your body physiologically wake you up. Um, but also, you know, from an insomnia standpoint, it's a question of, are you waking up and staying awake or are you waking up yeah. and you're able to fall back asleep? If you're waking up and staying awake, all the insomnia protocol says to get up, which sounds totally counterintuitive, huh. but it's the, it's called the 2020 rule in insomnia treatment. And it's the idea that if you're awake for 20 minutes and tossing and turning in bed, get up and get out of bed for 20 minutes and go do Mm. something quiet, sit on a couch somewhere, maybe read a book, you know, just something kind of chill, listen to music, whatever, pet your dog, whatever it may be. And then when you start to feel sleepy again, then go back to bed. Because what happens is the longer you stay in bed awake, tossing and turning, the more your brain starts to associate bed with a place of wakefulness as opposed to sleepfulness. Interesting that connection to be. So it's really, really hard to get yourself out of bed because most people in that moment where they're tossing and turning and can't fall back asleep, they're willing themselves to go to sleep, right? They're in their head saying, I'm going to fall asleep. I'm going to fall asleep. I know I'm going to fall asleep and they don't want to give up, but really we know, we know we're awake. So yeah. you can get yourself up and go do something calm and quiet for 20 minutes or so until you start to feel a little like that again. Yeah. Um, and then kind of bring yourself back to bed and try and go to sleep again, as opposed to forcing it when you know, it's not going to happen. What about nighttime eating? I know a lot of people struggle with that. They wake up just like that in the middle of the night and mm-hmm. they're straight after all the goodies. What do you yeah. have any insights about that? So it's, it's habit, right? That's, that's 100% habitual behavior. Very few people wake up in the middle of the night with legitimate um, hunger physiological hunger. Um, so it's usually association. I wake up in the middle of the night and I go to the, the cupboard. Mm. And so like anything, when you're talking about habit change, it's usually, usually about replacement behaviors. Mm-hmm. So if you wake up and go to the cabinet, what can you do instead? What are you looking for? What are you needing? Are you needing soothing? Are you needing comfort? How can you get that another way? Can you get up and make a cup of tea and sit and cuddle with a weighted blanket and enjoy your tea? Can you give yourself a massage? Can you, again, sit and cuddle your pets, right? What can you do in that moment that meets the need Mm -hmm. and creates a new behavior, a new Mm -hmm. habit? Because that's really just an association. Mm. And I forgot to ask you, like, what qualifies as technical insomnia and just disordered sleep? So insomnia is either inability to fall asleep or frequent waking with inability to fall back asleep. Okay. For an extended period of time. And what tends to happen is you get in your head about it and then you convince yourself that it's going to happen. And then your belief that it's going to happen is what keeps it going. Wow. So let's say you've gone to sleep three nights in a row and every night you haven't been able to fall asleep. The fourth night you say, I know I'm not going to be able to fall asleep. And then boom, just like that, you've created the insomnia because wow. you've set it up to happen before it's happened. It becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Mm, so a lot of like insomnia, everything else. Yeah. <laughs> so in, a lot of insomnia management is dealing with those thoughts, right? We call them sleep thoughts and negative sleep thoughts. Wow. The idea of telling yourself something's not going to happen before it happens and, you know, deciding something's going to be a problem before it's a problem. And it becomes this self-sabotaging behavior, right? And so dealing wow. with that from a self-sabotage standpoint, as opposed to a physiological standpoint. For most people, insomnia is not something that's happening happening physiologically. It's happening right here. Wow. That's amazing to know. Thank you for that. And then so disordered sleep would just be like, you go to bed at all different times or. Yeah. You, you're, you have no concept of a sleep schedule. You sleep 
for small periods of time or long periods of time and it, and it waxes and wanes and maybe you're not sleeping in an environment that's conducive to sleep or you're giving yourself three hours sleep here, two hours sleep there, that sort of thing. Or, um, you know, maybe, you know, you're using things like alcohol to help with sleep or, right. you know, other, you know, you're, you're, you know, you're having a lot of stimulants throughout the day and then a lot of downers in the night to kind of help counterbalance the stimulants instead of reducing the stimulants, right? All of these other factors that just impair your sleep and make it so you're not getting good quality sleep regularly. Yeah. Thank you. Wow. Yeah, and I love, I, I just want to highlight and emphasize what you were saying about the hormone imbalance that gets created. Yeah. I, I was reading a study that really impacted me where they took like, they took some metabolically healthy men and had half of them get eight and a half hours of sleep and half of them get five and a half. Mm-hmm. And the ones that got five and a half, they were, their blood sugar regulation was like, yeah. they were insulin resistant yeah. just yeah. From- one night of sleep yeah. deprivation. Well, there are there are three hormones in particular, leptin, ghrelin, and insulin that all kind of get get sort of balanced, so to speak, in a very simplistic way during sleep. And um, you know, we, we all know about insulin and what insulin does, but ghrelin is our hunger hormone. And ghrelin is the hormone that kicks in when we're biologically hungry. But if that hormone is not balanced correctly, it kicks in when we're not hungry. And yeah. so it tells us we're hungry when we're not. And that's something that most people are, are not able to fight. I always tell people, you cannot fight your hormones. They will win 100% of the time. <laughs> that's yeah. what I say too. I'm uh-huh. like, that is not a battle. You're going to win. Uh-huh. Grilling, grilling, yeah. Because yeah. that's what it feels like. It's yeah. like, this, like maniacal, like I, there, this is, you, it's like you, almost like you're a robot. <laughs> oh my gosh, like, absolutely. This is happening. You are powerless. And <laughs> leptin is the hormone that tells us we're full when we've had enough to eat. And so if those two hormones are messed up, it means we constantly think we're hungry and we never get told we're full. And so we're eating, we're eating, we're eating. And now our insulin is also imbalanced, which means our blood sugar isn't balancing the way it can be. So we're having these massive blood sugar spikes. We're eating too much. We never feel full. I mean, it's clearly a recipe for disaster Mm -hmm. that we can control by simply getting good sleep. (laughs) <laughs> totally. I have lived it. I have hundred uh-huh. percent lived it. It is crazy. What happens when, when that ghrelin takes over? Oh it's my just, gosh. Yeah. Yeah. And of course you're, it's not saying, Hey, go eat some roasted chicken breast. No, it's, <laughs> it wants the, the easiest form of energy it can get, which is simple carbohydrates, right? Yep. Processed flour, processed sugar. That's what it asks for. Yeah. Not to mention, uh, you know, serotonin, like if, if you're wanting to boost your serotonin, you're going to want to be eating foods that are high in those sugars too. Mm -hmm. So it's like, it just seems like your body's doing everything it can to feel better. And I'd say that's in general, like what's driving our behaviors in general is that we think whatever we're going to do is going to make us feel better. Yes. But really when we can fundamentally get back into that calm, healthy place, we don't need things to make us feel better. And that's such a wonderful place to be. (laughs) <laughs> well, and, and to your point about serotonin, um, right. I mean, so, so carbohydrates are, 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 our most preferred source of energy, right. Yeah. And, um, our body will crave simple carbohydrates. Like I said, processed flour, or processed sugar, because they give us that energy the quickest, Yeah. but we get that from complex carbohydrates as well. It's just not as quick. Right. So if we're eating complex carbohydrates regularly, our body and brain never get to the place right. where they're asking for the simple stuff because we're getting it anyways. Yep. We're getting the serotonin release that we want from those carbohydrates as well. So it generally only happens when we give ourselves no carbohydrates or we give ourselves a lot of processed carbohydrates because that's yeah. what our brain says is our only source. So yep. the more we're kind of balancing all of this stuff nutritionally, the less these things become problematic and out of whack. Yeah. Oh man. You know what? I, I don't know if you've, if you have experience with this or you see this a lot, but I have teenagers, sorry. I have a 15 year old and a 13 year old and two more kids, but my teenagers, I have been absolutely appalled by, I'm serious. I'm, I told him, I'm like, I'm going to make a whole video. I'm gonna make a freaking YouTube video about talkies. I'm so mad about these freaking chips. I don't know if you know what talkies are, yes. but all the kids are, yeah. they're just walking around. My, 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 actually my 10 year old said that there's a kid in his class that just brings a bag of talkies for lunch every day. And I'm looking at these things. They're full of MSG. They're full of red 40. They're full of canola oil. They're just, yeah, they're not even remotely real food corn. They have blue ones now. And, <laughs> you know, and I'm looking at these poor 
kids and I'm, I'm, I'm seeing how many of them are being put on antidepressants, anti-anxiety medications. Yep. They're not sleeping. They're on their phones until, you know, one in the morning, getting up at six for school. And then they're eating talkies and, and nobody's know. looking at their diet. Yeah. It's like, a like, contributing factor. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, when you work with people like, and where do you, where do you start that, you know, where does the focus go? Is it kind of all at once? Like here, we're going to bring in more complex carbohydrates, real food and sleep, or like, what's your approach? No, not even remotely. Okay. I I am. I'm all about the slow roll. Good. Um, (laughs) I generally start where people want to start. And, um, when I work one-on-one with people in particular, I, I usually will let them guide. Um, Mm -hmm. we may identify several different areas, that we need to address, whether it be sleep, whether it be stress, whether it be emotional eating, um, you know, relationship with food-based stuff or even food content. But I let them pick where they want to start because people will either pick the place that they feel is the most impactful or the place that's the easiest for them to start with. And either one of those are fine. Yeah. Because if it's the most impactful, then clearly it will have an impact quickly and they'll feel the benefit and that will reinforce it. But if it's the place that's easiest for them to start, then they set themselves up for success instead of failure. It doesn't become a, let me tackle the hardest thing and I can't do it. Now I'm a failure and I quit. Right. Right. Um, It's okay. I started with the thing that was easy. I did it. I feel good about myself. I feel confident. I feel like now I can take more on. So either one of those places to start are great for me. And they build in that accountability. If somebody's choosing them, as opposed to me just saying, do this. Very good. I love that. That, That's wonderful. And so important, especially, yeah, those small wins feeling like you're winning is everything because it puts you in this high vibe. Yeah. It's like, I'm a winner. So then you Mm -hmm. act like a winner. Yeah. (laughs) Have that positive self-talk. Yeah. And it's all often about in that respect, kind of breaking down bigger goals into smaller ones so that you continually achieve those wins. Right. If you say, I want to lose 50 pounds this year and that's your only goal you only get that win at the end of the year when you lose 50 pounds. But if you say, I want to lose a pound a week, you get that win every week. You get to celebrate and acknowledge what you've done and remind yourself of your your capabilities and your accomplishments every single week. And that's so much more effective to keep that momentum going. You talked about good foods and bad foods. I love this. I actually wrote, I'm writing a book right now and I wrote about this in it because like this whole, that's Oh, this toxic mental and emotional cycle that happens when you quote unquote, eat a bad food. It's literally like now I'm bad. Yeah. That's exactly what it's like. Yeah. And then one of my friends, actually, I loved this. Um, he said, he's like, you know, we're really hard on McDonald's, but, and we call it bad, but he's like, if you were starving to death, in the desert, a McDonald's, you know, Whopper or not a Whopper, but I don't even, obviously I don't go there, whatever <laughs> McDonald's hamburger and, and a soda would actually uh-huh. be really great for longevity. Yep. <laughs> so context, you know, and I was like, Oh, yeah. that like sticks us in our little nutritionists, you know, mm-hmm. sewer spots. But I love the, um, the challenge on that because it's like, Hey, be careful when calling all these things bad, because yeah. it really does create these shame cycles. Can you talk about oh that? Oh my gosh. Yes. Um, I, I, I always talk about the idea of needing to unlearn what you've learned. Mm-hmm. And I have a chapter in my last book about erasing the diet mentality and getting rid of your diet language, because so many of the people I work with come from this history of yo-yo dieting. And we're mm-hmm. trying to break that mentality and embrace something new. And they bring all their diet language with them, which mm-hmm. is words like calories and points and good food and bad food and right and wrong and cheats mm-hmm. and, you know, on plan and all of these different words Mm. that are associated with food and food is food. It's not good or bad eating something. It, it, some food is inherently healthier or more nutritious than others, but you then need to go further into how does it make you feel right? There are plenty of foods that are nutritionally healthy, but maybe they don't make you feel good. Maybe you have some digestive issues with that or your body doesn't respond as well right. to that. And then is that now a bad food? Probably not. It's still a healthy food. <laughs> right. And so, yes, there are some foods that are inherently healthier than others, but it's not about good, bad, because as soon as it becomes dichotomous like that, then your behavior becomes dichotomous like that. Yeah. Like you said, you eat a bad food. Now you're bad. You've done wrong. You've made a mistake. You've been a failure. You've screwed up, right? But who doesn't eat foods that are unhealthy from time to time, right? The idea is not that you cut these foods out or that these foods are not a part of your world or are labeled as bad. It's just maybe we try and eat healthy. 
Maybe yep. we're trying to eat healthier. Maybe try and incorporate more healthy foods into your diet. But everything has to be about moderation. Yeah. Um, if you're living in a world that is incredibly restrictive, I can't have these foods. These yeah. foods are bad. Then what happens is those foods become the center of your universe. They I become know. all you think of, right? Yeah. If pizza is a bad food and you're no longer allowed to have pizza, all you think about is pizza. And what happens when you're alone with pizza, instead of having a piece of pizza, you have all the pizza yep. because you've given it this power over you by restricting yeah. it. Totally. And if instead you live in a world of moderation where once a week you have two slices of pizza, most likely over time, once a week, you're going to have two slices of pizza. You're going to enjoy the heck out of it. Yeah, It's going to be delicious. You're going to look forward to it. You're going to enjoy it, but it's not going to overpower you. Mm -hmm. It's not going to take over your universe because you're allowed to have it and you get to have it again. It's not even a one-time thing. Yeah. I always say, I, I feel like I'm like, you're asking for your inner child to come out super hard when you do that. That's why I don't, you know, we talked about a little before the show started, even though I see benefits in the ketogenic diet, I struggle with it. I'm mm -hmm. open about it. I really, mm -hmm. really struggle. I'm like, it's gotten to the point where I'm like, unless you have some like severe therapeutic need for this. Like mm -hmm. I am just stepping back and stepping back and stepping back because I'm so tired of seeing people with all these disordered eating patterns. And now they're like, I'm, I'm addicted yeah. to all these carbs. And I'm like, mm, are you addicted? I'm not trying to dismiss as maybe people really have that going on, mm -hmm. but I just want to like put the question out there. Maybe it's the restriction that's creating that addiction yes. in the first place by yes. prohibiting it so bad because yeah. yes, then you have a, you have a bite of cake at somebody's party and you already blew it. Quote so unquote. you might as well just eat all the cake and yeah. start again on Monday. Yep. And now you become like a binge eater for yep. like nothing. Like why, you know, so yeah. that it does, it definitely concern me. And, you know, I, I always say like, our inner child is strong. The inner, whether you know your inner child or not, he or she is in there and they are alive and well, and they mm -hmm. are you. And surprisingly <laughs> and, powerful. <laughs> yeah. And I always, my, my little Micah, he's eight. He is a, he is a, um, very outspoken, fiery, passionate. will say what he thinks. And I'm like imagining me walking up to him and being like, Hey, Micah, you can't have M&Ms. Micah, you can't have M&Ms just randomly. Micah, no more candy. Micah. Hey, Mike, so you can't have candy. You know, like what would happen? All of a sudden he'd be like, all he candy, 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 about. candy, 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 that's all, all I want is candy, you know, and mm -hmm. that's what we do to ourselves. Exactly what we do to ourselves. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So thank you. Thank you for that insight. Um, Okay. So let's say somebody, their first thing they want to work with you is like, I want to, I want to eat better. Like, mm -hmm. I, you know, what is that? Where do you, where do you start? Well, I always start by having people food log. Mm -hmm. um, it's a simple way to gather data, but I am very specific about the type of data I try and gather because I don't want people to food log via my fitness pal or any of these trackers that hyper fixate them on calories and macros and all of this stuff. Mm -hmm. I want them to just pay attention to what they're eating, when, and why. So I will usually have them do this either pen and paper, old school, or like a note in their phone where they just write down what time is it? Hmm. What did they eat? And not in weights and measurements, right? I always say, if you have a turkey sandwich, you can just write down turkey sandwich, right? Mm -hmm. Because in my fitness pal, that takes 20 minutes to log. Yeah. What bread did you have? How many ounces of turkey? How many ounces of cheese? How many ounces of condiments? Uh -huh. Let me find the brands. And you know, make it really, really easy so that you're not turned off to the idea of, of blogging. And then is there any context to why you ate when you ate? Hopefully a lot of the time it's hungry, but is there anything else? I saw it and it just looked good to me, or I was bored, or I was stressed out, or I was at a friend's house and it was just out on the counter. Right? Can we look at some of these factors that are causing you to eat when the reason is something other than hungry? Uh -huh. um, and then once people have kind of a food log put together that way, I will go through it with them and help them kind of identify areas of change. And ideally, they're things that they're identifying, because sometimes people will look at a week or two of this and be like, oh, my God, I went three days without having a vegetable. I can't believe that. Or <laughs> it looks like at 5 p.m. every day I have this unplanned eating and it's because I don't have a snack between lunch and dinner. And I really should have a planned snack because I'm always hungry at 5 p.m. Mm -hmm. And then I, because I wait till I'm hungry, I go to the first thing I see. Or So I'll, I'll look at it with them and, and help them identify where these areas of change can start. Um, and it's amazing how people can see it when it's on paper like that, whereas they can't 
see it when it's just their behavior. Mm. And so usually I'll start with the thing that's, that's most clear. Um, it can be something like, are there fruits and vegetables in your diet? And how frequently do we notice a glaring omission? Um, is, are there omissions certain days? Are there omissions certain times? Where can we add that in in a way that's simple, that you'll enjoy, that's easy for you? Is the problem that you're not preparing food ahead of time? And if you had food prepared, would it change some of your food decisions? And what can you do to set yourself up for that? Is the problem that you don't plan eating at certain times when you actually are hungry. And so as a result, you go to other things. Is there a point in the day where you're always bored and you turn to food? Is there a point in the day where you're always tired and you turn to food, right? Finding some of these commonalities in your food log help identify areas that we can start to focus and make change. Yeah. I love that. Noticing the patterns, the why behind everything, like you were saying at the beginning, it's beautiful. And speaking of journaling, I wanted to make sure that we highlight your self-sabotage behavior workbook, which okay. is so cool. Um, so I, you know, I'm pulling this off your website, but you, you say that <laughs> the most common self-sabotaging behaviors include procrastination, comfort eating, self-medication with drugs or alcohol. Uh-huh. Um, can you talk about this, this workbook and, you know, why somebody might benefit or might be interested in using something like this? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the self-sabotage behavior workbook my, my, is my most recent book. And it's basically about overcoming self-sabotaging behaviors in any area, whether it be health and wellness or relationships or career or finances or anything. It's kind of all encompassing. But, you know, it, it definitely stems from my work in the health and wellness space mm-hmm. because with my weight management clientele, it's almost always self-sabotage based in the sense that I never encounter somebody in my work who doesn't know that an apple is healthier than a cookie. Yeah. But when confronted with an apple and a cookie, they still choose the cookie and they don't know why. And there's usually a self-sabotage component associated with that. And that could be based in fear. Um, I talk a lot about fear of success and fear of failure as it relates to Mm self-sabotage. And you see fear of success and fear of failure come into play a lot with people who struggle with weight loss and yo-yo dieting, Hmm. um, there's often a fear of failure because they failed before. And a lot of people don't want to put in the time and effort because they think it's just going to end up taking them to the same place. So why bother? And so we have that factor. They also have a fear of failure around the idea of letting people know that they're doing this. And then what happens if they fail? And now they've, this is highlighted. People see that they've done that. Hmm. But then there's this fear of success component, which is really interesting, which people don't always get right away because they think, why would you fear success? Success is by definition what you want, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but so, so many people have been trying to achieve weight loss, health, wellness, whatever it may be for so long that there's this idealized perspective of what comes along with it. Mm-hmm. And there's there's two things that tie into that. One is is well, what if that doesn't give me everything I've always wanted? Hmm. What if I achieve what I've wanted in the weight loss realm and it doesn't bring me all the joy and happiness I've always assumed it would? Hmm. Um, And that's a real fear for a lot of people. And then there's also the what now effect of, well, I've been focused on this my whole life or what feels like my whole life. If I achieve it, then what? What what do I do then? What do I focus on? What am I about? I've been Hmm on and off a diet for 20 years now, if all of a sudden I'm just good, then what do I do? Right. And then there are these added pressures in the whole world of maintenance, right? If I have a weight loss goal and I achieve it, my fear is, is failure after success, right? Mm -hmm. So I succeed. And then what happens? Do I go back again? And so there are all of these fears that tie in and we self-sabotage so we don't have to face those fears. And that's where we engage in um, a lot of the behaviors you were talking about. Like, for example, I, I went to a party and ate an unplanned cupcake. So I said, oh, well, might as well have a binge fest and, and start my diet again on Monday. Right. It's, it's the ultimate in self-sabotage, right? It's the right. cliche of saying, you know, if you, if you get a flat tire, do you then go and puncture all three of your other tires, right? right. Why would you engage in behavior that says, okay, I, I have one little thing let me make it a really, really big thing. Why would you set yourself up for that instead of saying, okay, I'll just address this one little thing and move on. And self-sabotage is usually the reason for that because we have all of these, these underlying fears. And so if you're not addressing those fears, you're not going to get very far. It's going to keep popping up and, and rearing its ugly head, so to speak. 
Yeah. So good. You guys, I highly recommend snagging that self-sabotage workbook. Thank you for sending me one out. I was like, (laughs) there's so much power to just having to write down the answer to a question about Mm -hmm. yourself on a freaking piece of paper. (laughs) That's why I did it that way because it's it's not enough to just read it. Right. Yeah. Because you read it and you're like, oh yeah. Oh yeah. But then as soon as you need to sit down and say, okay, well, let me look at this in me and let me put pen to paper. Right. Why do I do that? a real thing, right. you know, you connect the dots in your brain as well. Yeah. Wow. I love what you're saying about, um, fear of success. I always, I, I, I I'll be honest. I never quite understood fear of success. I'm like, is it just like, it doesn't make sense when you think about failure, it, yeah. like they don't really think they're going to do it, but you know, and I thought some people, another thing that came to my mind as you were saying that is like, I think there's a social, because I think sometimes people have judgments of successful people. Mm-hmm. And so they're worried that other people will judge them. If they become like that, I see that too. Sometimes yeah. like I'll lose my friends if I'm, uh-huh. you know, <laughs> successful or whatever, you know, the stories are. Um, and I think it's, yeah, it's so valuable for us to look at like what those deep underlying beliefs are because they constant, they will be a constant block. Con- yeah. That's definitely one thing I've learned yeah. in myself, yeah. a block everywhere in yeah. every aspect of your life especially if you're trying to do deep growth work, Uh you know, if there's some sort of judgment or deep belief system that there's something bad, something negative associated with that result, we will just never do it. We will never get there. Yeah. 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 No, you're absolutely right. And you know, it's, it's, I, I talk about this in my book, the kind of approach, approach avoidance conflict, because there in almost everything that we want to achieve in life, again, I'll use a career example because this is one that people can relate to pretty easy. There's there's good things about achieving that success and not so good things about achieving that success. Yeah. Right? If you're yeah. trying to get a promotion and you get the promotion, there are great things about that. There's the status and the prestige and maybe more money and more no- notoriety and all of that. But then also maybe there's more work and maybe yeah. there's more pressure and maybe it pulls you away from your home life and your social life more, right? So there's there's push and pull to both sides of the equation. Yeah. And you need to be able to look at that and really understand that in, a, in, in order to be able to kind of push through it and not have this stuff pull you just as much as this stuff does. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. Understanding that everything is multifaceted and being able to look at that objectively and accept that and then make your decisions based off of, you know, yeah. reality and not just this one delusional belief system. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I love that. Um, I just wanted to share real quickly that you have other books. You have Shatter the Yo-Yo yeah. um, and also um, Weight Loss and Wellness, The Other Things You Should Know. Um, and I was just, in, again, guys, the name of the workbook is the Self-Sabotage Behavior Workbook. Um, and then that's Candi- by Dr. Candice Seti. It's at Seti, S-E-T-I. Um, is there anything else that you would like to share with the audience that you offer that they might be interested in? Um, sure. Um, well, Shatter the Yo-Yo, um, that book is basically about helping people break dependence on diet and learn how to manage their weight through lifestyle, behavioral, and cognitive changes. Um, and that's a lot of what I do in my practice when I work with people one-on-one. Um, and then I also have a bunch of programs available online for people that want to kind of DIY it um, and go work at their own pace. Um, I do have a Shatter the Yo-Yo online program that people can do. Um, I have a few weight loss and weight management programs for specialty populations like PCOS um, and perimenopause and menopause, nice. um, as well as dealing with picky eaters, um, for parents with picky eaters. Um, so I have all that available. I have um, uh, a weight loss uh, jumpstart program, um, a 10-day wellness and weight loss jumpstart program that people can do. So that's all on my website. So people can just kind of yeah. And the website cruise. is meonlybetter.com. Correct. And we will link all of this in the show notes, you guys. And, um, man, Dr. Seti, I just want to say thank you for being you and doing the work that you do. I, you know, I shared this with you before we started, but I'm like, I feel so caught between <laughs> the world sometimes because I am in fitness and training and nutrition. And I also am constantly having these feelings of like, what are we doing here? What yeah. are we doing? Like, yeah. what, what is the reason behind all this? Are we actually driving into like manic, crazy behaviors that are taking away from your life or is this building your life? You know, right. it really is about like, what I've come to is like, it's about how you feel. How do Amen you to that. feel from the inside is <laughs> all that matters, you know? Uh-huh. And I shared, I've gained weight since my crazy bikini competition experience. And 
it's funny because people were like, oh, like you'll bounce back or what? I'm like, I'm not trying to bounce back. I'm like, good. Yeah, I'm good. I, I just great. went for I'm a happy. run today and I feel great. Like uh-huh. I'm super healthy. Like, you know, it's, but this chronic mentality of like, ha- never enoughness of like, yeah. you know, it, it concerns yeah. the crap out of me. So yeah. I really appreciate the work that you do. And I appreciate you coming and sharing that with my audience today. And we will make sure that they can participate in whatever you have to offer and partake of these books. So we'll link that all below. And um, awesome. yeah, thank you so much. It was so great chatting with you. You too.